Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's roundtable on fueling the middle class, bringing a job lens to Canada's resource and environmental debates. I'm very pleased to have such a great number of excellent guests from across the country, representing many different sectors, from the government to the resource sector to the social sector and other places as well. Um, it's Cardis's preference to do these types of events in a place uh, with actual people uh, where we can share a beverage and see one another face to face. Um, but this is second best. And uh, we look forward to continuing these conversations in person when all of us are vaccinated and this cursed uh, plague passes. Um, there's one benefit and it's sort of apropos this conversation, which is that uh, it's a very low emissions uh, event and uh, that's uh, at least a plus side. Um, we also have a great uh, set of speakers this afternoon, but before I introduce them, uh, I want to, uh, and by the way, it's morning and cheers to our friends in the prairies in BC. Before we begin to introduce our guests, I'd love to provide you with a brief introduction to Cardis and who we are. Cardis is a Canadian think tank that focuses on renewing North America's social infrastructure. And what we mean by that is this. Typically in our policy debates, discussions come down to two typical responses. The first response is government should. The government should start a program. The government should regulate, et cetera. And often this response decries the involvement of markets on a given issue. The second response, we hear almost exactly the same amount, is the market should. And typically this means that those with, um, that, that with more market freedom, the social issue could be solved. And often this response decries the involvement of government on a given issue. Cardis believes that while both sound public policy and free markets are important, Canada's most pressing problems go deeper than this binary. And that to leave it there often finds both the state's and the market's interests furthered at the cost of other social institutions, families, neighborhoods, educational institutions, business and labor associations, and so on. And that the weakness of those in turn weakens our democracy and our economy. Our work attempts to explore the dense weave of social relationships that lead to a good life and a just society. And that coincidentally are prerequisites for strong democracies and healthy vital markets. The underlying philosophy and grounding for our approach is drawn from a deep well of Christian social thought that informs public policy and occasionally manifests itself in political parties such as those led by Angela Merkel, the former prime minister of the Netherlands, Jan Balkenende, the solidarity movement in Poland in the early 90s and many places in Latin America and around the world. The connections with the paper that we wrote might start to become clear at this point. With our paper, we are attempting, as we say, to bring a job lens to bear on our resource and environmental debates. This paper is a case study for a larger project that Cardis has done this year entitled, Work is About More Than Money. In this project, which was launched with a paper by Dr. Morley Gunderson and I last year, we want to show that work involves far more than simply a paycheck. Work has deep implica implications for one's physical and mental health, for the good of communities, neighborhoods, learning, and families. We've seen tragically the effects of the loss of work that our paper shows, increased alcoholism, depression, domestic assaults, divorce, and other family and community breakdowns as a result of the unemployment brought about by COVID. We've seen it very clearly. But prior to COVID happening, these trends have already been in place in Canada society. And as we have seen, and as economist David Auteur notes, the results of not paying attention to jobs can have profound consequences for our society. At the end of the day, we want to remind people that discussions about resources and the environment have deep implications for people's work and that work has deep implications for their communities, their families, and ultimately their identities and meaning as persons. One of the things I like to do is, is uh, drop a bit of literature into policy discussions. My colleagues uh, make fun of me for it, but I do it anyways. And there's a particularly excellent passage from the late Canadian author and novelist, Alistair MacLeod, and his short story, Closing Down for Summer, that reflects this, this, this idea that work has deep connection to your identity and has deep meaning. A miner from Cape Breton reflecting on his work says this, quote, I've always wished that my children might join me at work, that they might journey down with me in the dripping cage to the shaft's bottom or walk the eerie tunnels of the drifts that end in walls of staring stone, and that they might see how articulate we are in the accomplishment of what we do. 
that they might appreciate the perfection of our drilling and the calculations of our angles and the measuring of our powder. And they might understand that we know through eye and ear, that what we know through eye and ear and touch is of a finer quality than any, any information garnered by the most sophisticated of mining engineers with all their elaborate equipment. There is perhaps a certain eloquent beauty to be found in what we do. It is perhaps akin to the violent motion of the huge professional athletes on the given days or nights of their many games. Men as huge and physical as we are, polished and eloquent in the propelling of their bodies toward their desired goals and in their relationships and dependencies on one another, but often numb and silent before the microphone of their sedentary interviewers." End quote. Part of what we're hoping to do here today is ensure that this articulation of work and its importance to the persons in their communities, indeed to our nation, remains at the heart of our policy discussions about the resource sector and the environment, both things that matter a great deal. That as we move to seriously address climate change, that people are seen as people, not simply job numbers or widgets that can be moved at the pleasures of the market or the state. And to help us do that today, we have a wonderful panel of four guests who can provide unique insights into the challenge of this. It is, as you'll hear in this conversation, not easy and it involves hard thinking about costs and benefits. Our first guest and my co-author, Sean Spear, is currently fellow in residence and Prime Minister Canada Fellow at the Public Policy Forum. He's also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And he previously served as a senior economic advisor to former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Our second guest, Rachel Sampson, is the research director for clean growth at the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. Rachel has worked at the intersection of environmental and economic policy for over 20 years as an economist, policy advisor, and manager at federal, multiple federal departments, and as a consultant for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and several Canadian think tanks. Rachel holds a master's degree in economics from Queen's University, just down the road from Brockville, just a little shout out to my hometown there, with a specialization in environmental economics. And she's recently done work on this file and I commend her work uh, to you, to your reading as well. Janet Lane, our third guest, is a subject matter and expert in literacy and essential skills development and in leading programs and organizations in the literacy field. As the demands for workforce evolve, her work focuses on the need to understand and build the competencies required for new jobs and changing work environments. Her education experience and proven track record for growing organizations contributes to her ability to connect human development with the skills and competencies that Western Canadian industries need. Our final guest is Wayne Prinz. Wayne began working for CLAC in 2003 after joining the union first as an operator working in the Northwest Territories. I'll bet that that was in the resource sector. He currently serves as the executive director for CLAC. The CLAC represents 60,000, nearly 60,000 members across Canada, working in a broad variety of sectors, including the resource sector. Wayne is passionate about advancing the rights and interests of workers within the context of a vibrant, stable, and safe work community. Wayne has a bachelor's degree in environmental studies at the King's University and an MBA from the Smith School of Business at Queen's University. And no, Queen's is not paying us to, uh, to uh, stack this panel with their alumni. Thank you. So as we begin this, um, as, as, I, as I move in, I just wanna to note uh, to everybody that there is a Q&A um, tab at the bottom that throughout this uh, conversation, if you hear questions, if something comes up and you wanna ask that question, please put that in uh, in the bottom and I will curate those. We will have a time for, for discussion. Um, and with that said, I wanna pass it over to uh, Sean Spear to provide us with a bit of context and to set the table for us. Sean, the floor is yours. Great, Brian. Thank you so much uh, for uh, both uh, facilitating this research and publication at Cardis. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor to work with you and the team. Um, and of course, for hosting uh, this discussion and involving such a diverse set of uh, perspectives and, and backgrounds uh, to talk about these thorny questions of the, the inherent trade-offs between advancing our climate goals um, with other considerations, including employment in the natural resource sector. Just a couple of, of um, contextual points to start with. Um, you know, it's not lost on me that we're having this conversation uh, within a, about a week or so of um, the most significant climate agenda 
uh, announced by the federal government in Canadian history. Um, Rachel will be better placed to talk about um, some of the specifics of that plan, but it's worth acknowledging that after years of of uh, failed attempts to, to advance uh, our goal towards uh, uh, meeting our emissions targets, we, we seem to have uh, in the federal government a commitment uh, to do uh, some of the substantive things that experts and scholars have, uh, have made the case for, for for several years. And, and so in, in some ways, uh, this conversation is even more relevant um, in, in, in light of that important announcement. The second contextual point I'd like to make is about my own interest in this topic. Um, it, it, I, I've said in other forums um, that the past four years of political economy across the uh, advanced world uh, has, in a way, radicalized me. Um, you know, the election of Donald Trump, in particular, has caused me to spend a lot of time thinking about the intersection between public policy, economics, and politics. Um, and, and trying to understand what I missed, what I underestimated, uh, and, and, and more pointedly, why millions of Americans uh, voted for the host of Celebrity Apprentice as their president. Um, these questions uh, are, uh, are necessarily overdetermined, and this isn't the forum to, 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 to debate the various perspectives and interpretations and analysis about uh, the rise of populism in our societies. But I think it's broadly accepted that part, part of the explanation is a sense amongst large share of, um, of our populations um, that public policy, that, that governance had come to neglect their interests, concerns, and aspirations. And I think there's certainly something to that. And one of the consequences for me personally anyway, as someone observing and analyzing matters of policy and governance is to try to um, infuse my work with a greater degree of, of empathy, um, particularly for those who are vulnerable uh, in, the, in the changing and uh, dynamic modern economy, what some have described as a transition from an economy of things to an economy of thoughts. And that brings me to uh, the paper that we released uh, uh, last, last month, I guess, on this question of um, the, the trade-offs between the environment and the economy and in particular, the role of the natural resource economy in supporting um, those workers who, who, who are most vulnerable uh, in light of some of the broader uh, economic and technological changes occurring in our societies. What, one of the things that I've come to believe uh, in, in, in recent years as part of this exercise uh, of introspection and analysis is that the way we think and talk about um, the env environment and the economy uh, pr risks precluding the, the type of debate that I think we need to have. A tendency on the part of policymakers from across the political and ideological spectrum to characterize the, to, to claim that the environment and the economy go hand in hand becomes an impediment to the type of conversation that I think we need to have about trade-offs. Um, and to try to, to try to convey that point, it's worth thinking for a minute about the similarities between climate policy and trade policy. One of, one of the similarities is a tendency towards what you might describe as di dispersed benefits and concentrated costs. Everyone would broadly agree that uh, as we enact trade policy, particularly pr pursuing free trade agreements, we need to think carefully about the so-called losers of free trade. And it's become a broadly accepted part of our um, policy consensus around issues of trade um, that the so-called losers need to be uh, rightly compensated for, uh, for the lost output or lost employment that comes with trade liberalization. Um, participants and listeners will be, of course, familiar uh, with, uh, with this issue with respect to uh, dairy farmers and a series of of instances in recent years where the government of Canada has uh, accepted adjustments to uh, its regulatory framework around, uh, uh, around that industry and an expectation really across the spectrum that those affected, both the people and the places, um, need to be considered and ultimately, uh, and ultimately compensated for the implications. When it comes to climate policy, I think we've 
there is a broad consensus that uh, households and individuals, the, the distributional effects for households and individuals certainly need to be part of the equation. And I think we've witnessed uh, this most, uh, th this um, uh, it, it, uh, view most, um, most clearly in the climate rebate that accompanies the federal government's carbon tax. Um, but it's my view, and, and it's expressed in the paper, um, that that consideration about the distributional effects, uh, well, it's uh, well we've observed it with respect to um, income. We haven't seen the same level of uh, commitment around observing the distributional effects with respect to employment. Uh, and and as uh, Brian says, uh, we we think this consideration around the distributional effects of climate action uh, on employment in places is a major analytical gap. Um, that not only risks um, undermining progress on climate policy, but actually risks um, uh, catalyzing um, greater disruption in our politics, in our society, as we've observed in other parts of the world. And a big reason for this um, is uh, the phenomenon of job polarization, which is, a, which is at the backdrop of these broader debates about uh, the climate and our economy. Um, for those who haven't had a chance to read the paper, I, I think its uh, description and analysis of job polarization is probably um, its most important contribution um, to the way we ought to think about these issues. What, one way to, to try to capture the idea of job polarization is, as succinctly as I can is that um, the goods producing economy of the uh, second half of the 20th century um, found most jobs, the vast majority of jobs, clustered in and around um, the, uh, the middle of the skills distribution. It was, um, in its structure, a highly egalitarian economy. And what's interesting is, for the better part of uh, the past quarter century, um, Canada, and indeed advanced economies around the world, um, have seen a, a, a trend towards job polarization. So rather than um, the, the preponderance of jobs clustered in around the middle of the skills distribution, we've actually seen um, a, relative, a growing share of jobs reflected at the, at the low uh, tail of the skills distribution and at the high tail of the skills distribution. Uh, and as I say, this is a phenomenon that really uh, has been observed across advanced economies. Um, and to, to try to put that uh, in concrete terms for you, um, between 1990 and 2019, uh, the share of jobs uh, in the middle of the Canadian skills distribution went from 58% to 53%. So it fell by uh, five percentage points. Uh, and, and that change uh, has varied across the country. So in Ontario, in Quebec, for instance, um, the, the, the drop in the share of jobs in the middle of the skills distribution uh, is more than 10 percentage points. And that is uh, mostly a function of the decline in manufacturing employment, which scholars incidentally attribute about 40% of all job, polar all job polarization uh, generally to, to, to the decline of, of manufacturing. But what's interesting and important for our discussion is that there have been some outliers um, in this, in, in this uh, trend, in particular, um, between um, 1999 and 2019, Alberta and Saskatchewan um, diverged from this trend, not just in Canada, but across the advanced world, um, in that um, they saw an actual increase in the relative share of uh, mid-skilled jobs uh, across the skills distribution. And um, in, a, in, a, in effect, um, as we observe in the paper, um, building on scholarship by, um, by other scholars and other experts on these questions, um, a major explanation for why um, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan have managed to avoid this, uh, what's sometimes described as hourglass economy, what we characterize in the paper as the vanishing middle, is uh, largely a function of the uh, labor demand from the natural resources sector which has um, counteracted um, this broader trend of job polarization elsewhere in the economy. And I say this is an important backdrop to this broader conversation 
um, because as we make progress or as we enact policies in the name of climate progress, which I, I think everyone in, in, in good faith wants to, um, wants to pursue, we need to think seriously about the people and places who uh, are affected, particularly since uh, I think one can argue, and indeed the paper does argue, um, that, it's, that it's this sector that, um, in particular that has played such an important role uh, as serving as a bulwark against these broader trends of job polarization across the Canadian economy. Um, and we, we, we cite um, uh, economists David Green and, and Benjamin Sands, uh, who particularly observe um, that the natural resource sector has played this role, um, as has a UBC economist, Kevin Milgan, uh, who some may be uh, familiar with. I think Kevin presently uh, is working in the Privy Council office uh, until the end of this year um, on, on secondment. But uh, uh, Kevin has, a, uh, has made the case elsewhere as well um, that the natural resource sector is one of the primary reasons why the Canadian middle class has performed so much better um, than um, elsewhere in peer jurisdictions. So maybe just in sum, um, uh, I, I, would, I would make kind of two or three points, Brian. The, the first is um, it's crucial that as a society, as a country, uh, we're uh, advancing uh, policies uh, to address climate change, to make progress towards our emissions targets. Um, uh, I, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Um, but as we, as we carry out that work, we have to make sure that we're not just thinking about the distribution with respect to income um, and uh, the costs of those policies with respect to household expenditures. It's also crucial that we're thinking about um, their distributional effect on jobs um, 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 because of um, the, these broader trends of job polarization and the extent to which um, the natural resource sector has played such a crucial role um, in protecting Canada um, uh, against um, the, these broader trends of, of, of job polarization, which is, in, in my view, played such an, a, an important part of um, the disruption and um, um, and political populism that we've observed uh, across uh, peer jurisdictions, including obviously most um, most pointedly in the United States. And um, I think if the paper can have, you know, in my view, success will be measured um, not by abandoning the climate agenda, the success of our paper, I mean, not by abandoning climate action, um, but by bringing this job lens to the way we think and talk and debate about um, carrying out climate policies and the best means to do that in a way that preserves the strengths of our natural resource economy. And so maybe with that, Brian, I'll just uh, thank you again and, and, and Cardis uh, for giving me the chance to, to carry out this work and, and be part of today's conversation. Thanks, Sean, I appreciate that. That was succinct and clear and, and I appreciate it. And uh, shout out to Maggie in the background there. Um, I'd love to uh, uh, pass it over to Rachel. So the next sort of segment, we're going to have each of our panelists respond uh, to Sean's presentation and the paper itself. So everyone will have a chance to do that. If you do have questions, just again, an encouragement to put them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom. Um, I will do my utmost to do something that is almost impossible for me to do, which is keep my opinion to myself and simply uh, moderate those for you. So um, don't hesitate to do that. Um, especially as the, the speakers uh, begin to respond. So Rachel, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks for having me as well. I think these are exactly the type of conversations we should be having at this point. Um, so I'm going to start by, by noting several areas where I think the report hits the mark and makes some really important part, points. Um, the first is that people and communities should be at the heart of discussions on low carbon transition and I, I agree that too often they are left out of debates um, that tend to focus on technology choice or policy choice. And this is something that our institute recognized in a report that we produced in uh, September, which uh, offered a different definition of clean growth that had been used in the past. And we didn't just look at the economy and the environment, we also looked at the well being of Canadians. And we included um, indicators of progress, things like jobs, energy affordability, 
resilience to a changing climate and clean air. So things that, that would matter to individuals. And what struck us is that well-being really occurs at the regional and local level. And it's something that's hard to measure nationally. And that a lot more research is needed at that regional and local level to get the transition right. And that that hasn't been really done uh, significantly to date. The second thing that I'll agree with is that natural resource sectors are fundamental to the well-being of many communities and rural and Indigenous communities in particular across Canada. So when we're talking about economic opportunities of low carbon transition, those often focus on high tech sectors that are mainly concentrated in cities. And we can't forget about the rural communities and the need to find ways to maintain or even increase job opportunities in those regions. And the third thing I'll agree with too is that education and skills are critical factors in determining who is most vulnerable to transition. I mean, we know that people with lower levels of education are more likely to be laid off and they're gonna have a harder time finding a new job. So those are the things I, re I, I think the paper really offers and it's a helpful addition to the conversation. There are a few things that I'll, I'll note where we may differ. Um, the, the first is that Canadian governments have little control over what happens in global markets. And some of the trends that we're seeing raise concerns about the future of oil and gas demand um, that, that may be something that Canadian governments are not able to address. So for example, in the last few months, we've seen major climate change commitments from some of the biggest countries in the world, China, Japan, South Korea, South Africa, have joined the EU and other countries in committing to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. And then if we add the US under a Biden administration, that means that countries responsible for more than half of uh, global oil and, oil and gas demand are committed to significant reductions in emissions. So what that means is that the International Energy Agency reference scenario for oil demand is probably no longer realistic. Um, we can argue over which, which scenario is and how much change will happen, but um, it's very likely that scenarios where oil demand peaks and then declines over the next decade are much more likely. And that doesn't mean zero oil demand, but it does make the market a lot more competitive. And that competition is gonna be based both on emissions intensity and costs of production. So Canadian companies may be able to meet that challenge, um, but the reality is investors are getting nervous. Uh, and so we're seeing some of that change in investor sentiment. The other thing is as oil and gas companies seek to stay competitive and reduce costs, there's a strong likelihood that they will seek to lower labor costs, which means job losses. And we already see these trends in declining oil and gas employment since 2015. And a study by EY Canada that was released earlier this week predicts that automation in the oil and gas sector could affect 30% of jobs by 2040. And the jobs that remain will probably require things like digital literacy. Um, so regardless of the policies that are pursued by Canadian governments on climate change, there are challenges ahead for the sector. The good news though, um, is that the natural resource sector is broader than oil and gas. And that many natural resources will face growing demand in global low carbon transition. We know clean electricity will be in high demand and rural areas have potential for geothermal energy, wind energy, solar energy. There's a lot of buzz about hydrogen. The government of Canada released a strategy today, I believe, talking about the potential for hundreds of thousands of jobs in hydrogen. Uh, the mining sector has a lot of potential for growth. Demand for things like nickel, copper, uranium, lithium, other minerals and metals expected to grow. There's excitement for things like manufactured wood projects, products, biofuels, plant-based proteins, and more. So there are opportunities in low carbon transition as well, and many of those could be available in rural areas. And on the opportunity side, uh, oil and gas companies themselves have the chance to diversify their product lines, take advantage of some of these new opportunities 
there's talk of bitumen beyond combustion, creating things like carbon fibers or asphalt from bitumen, um, and getting into some of these other product areas, using the skills in geothermal energy, hydrogen, biofuels. So I, I wonder if the question we should instead be asking is what the best strategy is overall to maintain jobs uh, in rural areas and in these communities and not necessarily about how to maintain oil and gas production. For me, it seems like uh, a hedging strategy might be preferable where you're seeking to diversify local economies. And that doesn't mean abandoning oil and gas. Um, those efforts to reduce emissions intensity and reduce costs should continue. But why not at the same time pursue these other economic opportunities where we see potential? Some may work, may not work out, but it is very likely that some will. Um, and those offer the chance to secure long-term employment that could be resilient across a range of different scenarios. So with that hedging strategy in mind, I would argue that more stringent climate policy could actually help more than it hurts. Um, many of the technologies needed to bring down oil and gas emissions intensity have been slow to develop at low carbon prices. Higher carbon prices and greater certainty on those prices can help drive the investment needed to improve the technology and bring costs down. The same can be said for some of those other opportunities outside the oil and gas sector. High, more stringent policy kickstarts demand and helps those sectors grow and develop and hopefully become competitive in global markets. More stringent climate policies can also provide some comfort to investors and to countries that are considering border carbon tariffs. So overall, I mean, I think this is a really helpful conversation uh, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. That's that's wonderful. I, I really appreciate that. And um, just want to uh, bring people's attention to the fact that we did uh, part of this uh, longer series of work that we've done on the resource sector. And the idea that the resource sector is more than just pulling oil out of the ground. It involves things like mining. Um, and what's interesting, we did a, a conference a number of years back. And we what we noted when we were talking about the resource sector, we're actually talking about the construction and engineering sector, which is a huge part of that, which, of course, has broad. Um, uh, broad implications beyond oil and gas, um, which is a good uh, segue uh, into uh, our next panelist, Wayne Prince. And Wayne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brian. And good day, everyone. It's great to be part of this discussion today. Um, I'm going to start with a quick introduction to CLAC. I make no assumptions about how much everyone knows about CLAC. We are a national union motivated by the belief that people businesses and work communities flourish when workplaces are based on cooperation and mutual respect. We believe collaborative partnership between labor and management creates more positive work communities and better outcomes for everyone. We also believe that when we honor the dignity of all work and the dignity of every worker, we not only enjoy more fulfillment from our labor, but we are also more productive, we are more innovative, and we are more resilient. CLAC was established in 1952 and is today one of the largest independent multi-sector unions in Canada. Uh, as Brian said earlier, we have 60,000 members who work in a wide range of sectors and industries, including healthcare, retail, uh, transportation, manufacturing, the service. For the sake of today's discussion, I will focus primarily on the work of about 30,000 of our members who are skilled and who are engaged in construction, fabrication, and maintenance work, uh, and incidentally, are, who are members of Canada's middle class. Now, there's nothing in this country that our members cannot build. We build hospitals, schools, bridges, arenas, uh, residential complexes, high rises. We can build anything. But the vast majority of the work that we do is somehow related to the natural resource sector. Just to give you some idea of the scale of what we're talking about, in the last 20 years, our members have built well over $100 billion worth of resource development infrastructure. This includes a long list of mega projects in the oil sands. It includes thousands of kilometers of pipeline, gas plants, upgraders, refineries, petrochemical complexes, sawmills, pulp mills, mines, 
uh, LNG facilities, hydro projects. In more recent years, we've experienced a dramatic rise in the level of activity in the renewable sector. So specifically solar farms and wind turbines, which has been a, a good development. These jobs and all the associated jobs created from this economic activity have been an incredible blessing to the workers, their families and their communities. And since our members are spread out across the country, these benefits are likewise shared with the entire country. I think the paper does a nice job illustrating just how significant the natural resource sector has been as a creator of opportunity for so many people. And I agree with the paper's claim that Canada's boom in the resource development sector in recent decades has been the main contributor to minimizing Canada's job polarization when compared to our peer countries. Now, the point of today's discussion is to talk about how we can preserve the progress that we've made in protecting and strengthening the middle class in the years to come. This would be a compelling discussion under normal circumstances, but increasing commitments to addressing climate change and a COVID-induced recession here in Canada make this conversation uh, even more timely and more critical. As I read and reflected on the paper, my mind kept going back to the work of the Task Force for Real Jobs, Real Recovery. Uh, they recently released a report called Securing Canada's Economic Future with Natural Resources for Real Jobs and Real Recovery. If you're not familiar with this task force, it was headed by Resource Works and Stuart Murr out of Vancouver. CLAC was a sponsor of and participant in the study. And the key findings of that report dovetail beautifully with the paper that we're discussing today. <clears throat> now the report is extensive. It includes 19 recommendations that we don't have time to talk about today, but those 19 recommendations fall into three main categories that I think really nicely align with today's discussion. The first set of recommendations has to do with mobilizing our resource prosperity. Canada has absolutely vast natural resources. And whether we like to admit it or not, our economy is still largely a resource-based economy. This being the case, we must embrace the resource sector and pursue legislation and regulatory oversight that celebrates and enhances responsible resource development, not that vilifies it. We need to ensure access to our resources and ensure our resources have access to markets. Likewise, we must ensure maximum Indigenous participation in Canada's resource prosperity, both through equity and employment. The second group of recommendations is using the resource sector to build meaningful employment. This includes job creation and preservation for both local communities and mobile workers from across the country. This includes building employment resiliency through inclusive workplaces and an emphasis on competency development. And again, this also includes ensuring Indigenous employment opportunities. The third bucket of recommendations has to do with accelerating innovation and environmental competitiveness by aligning climate action with natural resource development. This of course, speaks further to the belief that we can pursue ambitious climate and environment targets while continuing to develop our natural resources. For more information, here's a plug for the report. You can uh, look for that on your own, but it's certainly worth the read. Now, having said all of that, the most challenging aspect of these kinds of discussions is how to, how to structure public policy to achieve all these things that we're talking about. We can all agree that employment and strong economies are the foundation for stable society and human flourishing. We should also be able to agree that the consumption of non-renewable resources is inherently unsustainable and current levels of carbon emissions are problematic and also unsustainable. And while job, jobs associated with resource development are good and very important, I don't believe that we can or should try to justify any particular form of resource development simply on the basis of jobs alone. Taxes will always be used by governments to achieve certain objectives 
And I think putting a price on carbon is part of the solution. Basic economics for those who've studied it uh, will agree that where we are, where we know about clear negative externalities, as they're called, you do your best to apply a price to the social cost of that activity to drive behavior away from it. It's the same rationale of uh, heavy taxes on cigarettes, and I've supported that. The difference though between cigarettes and carbon is that I can't think of a single positive thing about smoking. I can think of a very long list of, of incredibly positive things about the consumption of carbon, to speak quite plainly. And I question whether the social goods of carbon are fully taken into consideration when determining the social cost of carbon. Regardless, Canada is well positioned to leverage smart climate action as a means of achieving desired policy outcomes while preserving maximum resource development. There may be those who would love to see our oil and gas industry shut down the moment the world needs less oil and gas. In my view, this is foolish. Just as an example, 100 years from now, when perhaps the world only needs 5 million barrels of oil per day, I would hope that most of those barrels are produced right here in Canada using the very best technology and the world's most skilled workers. That should be our long-term policy objective. Lastly, and not surprisingly, I believe that all Canadian workers and the entire Canadian economy would be well served if we had more and better unions in this country. Capitalism and free markets are good, but unfettered capitalism is very bad. And Appropriate legislation and a strong, smart labor movement that is based on union plurality and cooperative labor relations will be as key to preserving our middle class as any particular sector of the economy, including natural resources. There's my plug for organized labor. I'll leave it at that, Brian, back to you. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Wayne. You've uh, you've earned your uh, wages. That's good, and I appreciate that. I, I also would endorse that. Cardis also has done some work on on organized labor and its need for that, especially as the as polarization increases. Um, Wayne, you mentioned competencies, uh, and I think in, in your conversation, uh, the need for those and increased ability to move those from place to place. I think that's a perfect segue to our final uh, panelist, Janet Lane, who's done all kinds of great work on that. And so, Janet, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thanks to the rest of the panel. Uh, nice to be uh, able to, to pull it all together. Because I do agree so much with the main thrust of this paper. I mean, how could we not? People and places always have to be at the heart of policy. And so often they are not. Um, people who are creating policy don't always have a full systems thinking lens. And so they, they see the solution as being this policy, but they, they, they don't take into account the effects on and the, you know, the uh, pressures on other parts of the system when, they are, um, when they're creating policy. So thank you for making this paper available and for bringing that, this need to light. Um, there is no doubt when you talk about the uh, the impact of environment of event, environmental policies on the oil and gas sector is that they seem to be actually having a fairly negative effect, and the oil and gas sector has been a major employer in parts of this country for uh, for many decades, um, and because we've had those jobs, it has helped to reduce uh, job polarization. And those loss of jobs in, in recent years have had a devastating effect on people in, um, in Calgary and Edmonton, but also in rural areas of Saskatchewan and, and Alberta and parts of um, um, Newfoundland, because those jobs were the mainstay of, of many of our local communities. They, they brought middle-class jobs, middle, like really good wages, actually twice the national average wage. Um, to people who did not necessarily have high levels of education. Although I would say that our skilled workers, our skilled tradespeople are highly trained and very good at their jobs. Um, it also meant so much to indigenous communities as, as Wayne and, uh, and Rachel have mentioned that, you know, and, and it was in the paper, those 
communities have started to move from managing poverty to managing wealth because of the natural resources sector in many places, not, not all, we still have lots of work to do, but they have con uh, made considerable gains because of the sector. Having said that, before I go into further into, my, into the recommendations of the paper and my input, I need to say that, um, you know, the, the, the oil patches we affect, you know, affectionately call it here, wasn't all great, right? There were some major issues with it over, over the last uh, few years. And um, it, we were um, high emitters in our production. And because it was, um, oil and gas were developed for fuel and, uh, and were burned, then they were also high emitters. So that, you know, that's part of the problem. We understand that that's why these environmental policies are coming into place. But this sector always had its booms and busts and people were always, you know, getting jobs and being laid off from jobs and getting jobs and being laid off from jobs. And every time there was a boom, we promised to all the, that was holy that with this time we wouldn't waste it and we would sock away some of the, of the proceeds from that boom so that when we had another bust, we would be ready for it. And we never did. And this bust is different there's never going to be another lasting boom the way we've had it in the past. And it's not only because of government policies. As Rachel pointed out, international oil and gas investors have moved away from oil and gas. They're not seeing the returns on investment for the long term the way they have in the past. Um, and so it's not just environmental policy, it is uh, economic policy as well. Also, the kinds of jobs have changed and we knew they were changing. Even back in 2012, when I was working up in the oil patch in Fort McMurray, and that's where I first met Wayne, I was trying to get a project going to help develop the essential skills of workers in the oil patch to help them to have the cognitive skills to help to, to learn the new skills that they were going to have to learn as the oil sands moved from predominantly the construction phase into predominantly the operations and, oil and uh, maintenance phases. And so even back in 2012, be long before the, you know, the latest crash in 2014-15, we knew that jobs were going to disappear in the oil patch and the ones that remained were going to change and the people were gonna need different competencies. Um, and there's never going to be the same number of jobs work, of pe for people working in the oil patch. Again, as Rachel has, has said, there was a time of real inefficiency. I'm not saying that the workers were inefficient. I know that they knew what they were doing and when they got time on the tools, they did their jobs well. But at $100 oil, that was a huge, huge waste of time and waste of, of human capacity. And it helped us to become very complacent because people were making really, really, really good wages. And although they might've been putting long hours in on the job, they got paid by the hour and they, do, they weren't necessarily using their skills all the time that they were on the job. And I think that, uh, you know, when you, you look at the automotive sector in Ontario, very similar thing happened there when government put money into programs to keep the, the automotive plants open in Windsor and in Oshawa. It was, they were times when we could say, yeah, this is all these people can do and know how to do. And so we have to keep them in work. So let's make sure that we keep these plants open. And I would say that billions of dollars was, was thrown into keeping those uh, plants open at a time when some of that money needed to go into retraining people for the next kind of job that might be attracted attracted to the, the economy in, in Ontario. And what happened in Alberta was very much the same kind of thing. Because we had the jobs, because the, um, the, the money was, was so good, um, we grew complacent and we stopped thinking of ourselves as learners and needing to continuously be ready to upgrade and move into new and different jobs as time went on. And because the boom and bust cycle had always up till then had, you know, there had been the recoveries, people always thought, if I just hang on, I'll be able to get a job when, when things turn around. 
took a long time this time for people to realize that things aren't actually going to turn around in the oil patch to become, to go back to the way things were. But fortunately, as Rachel has pointed out and, and Wayne has, has acknowledged, there are new jobs that are coming in all kinds of natural resource sector and in changing the way we use carbon and in changing the way that we produce energy. And, you know, Suncor is, uh, is the largest wind producer in Canada. So, you know, the, the companies themselves have realized this. We need to, as a, as a society, think in terms of how can we help people make that transition. People are so tied up in their own um, identity. It is one of the things that we cling to. We, we ask our five-year-olds, what do you wanna be when you grow up? We ask our high school seniors and, and you know, graduating students, what are you going to learn when you go to school? We expect that when we finish our, our, um, our, our apprenticeships or our degrees or our diplomas, that that will be what we call ourselves for life. We had a uh, a gentleman in a project that I was running a couple of years ago who won't use his name, but when asked his name, he would say, John Doe PNG. You know, this was who he was. He was, his identity was what he did. And I know that that is particularly the case for, for men. Um, it has always been thus. So we, we are attracted and we, we hold on to our identity. We are also holding on to place much more than we ever used to. People are less likely to want to move for jobs than they ever have in the past. So how do we solve the problem that we have people who are unemployed or um, underemployed or wanting something different at a time when, um, when jobs are shifting so much? And this is where I get to talk about, um, about competencies because I really, really do believe that there are some very good jobs that are going to be available that may already be available and the ones that are coming in these new sectors, these new natural resource sectors that use carbon differently or, or um, extract different kinds of, of energy from different sources. How do we move people into those jobs? And I can hear you, Brian, I can hear you, Sean, because you said it in the paper. Those training programs have been mediocre in the past. And indeed, in many cases, they have. What we have to do now is, is think differently about how we go into that training. And we first of all have to look at the individual. People have aptitudes and they have interests and it's no use trying to say to somebody, you have this aptitude, but we've got a training program for you over here that doesn't take, pay any attention to who you are, who you hold on to being and where you live. So we need, we need to, first of all, to look at aptitudes and interests. And we also need to look at the competencies they have already built. No 40 year old or 45 year old or even 25 year old comes as a blank slate. They have competencies that they have already built. We need to know what they are. We need to help them to assess those and to articulate those competencies. We also need to look very hard and very long at the jobs that are coming and how and what competencies are going to be required to do those jobs well. And then we need to figure out how we can rapidly, quickly chain, uh, train people to move from where they're at to where they need to be. And that work needs to not be, do we have a program for you that is six weeks or six months long and you just got to be in this seat in this classroom on this day. That's not how people learn best anymore. It's, and we have really shown through COVID times that a lot of learning can be done in a lot of different ways. So we need the programs, we need the, the curriculum developed, but we need to be working with the, the people who are doing the training need to be working with the employers. And it needs to be demand led. Let's get people into jobs as quickly as possible. Let's train them on the job. Let's have um, classroom training going on the same week as they're working on the tools or in that job, learning the new digital skills or whatever it is that they need to learn. Let's have them mentored by people who are, have already made the transition. Let's pay them to learn. Looks a lot like apprenticeship, 
can't use that word because, you know, apprenticeship is only for the skilled trades. And maybe these aren't going to be the skilled trades anymore, but maybe they're going to be some version of that. And so I'm, I'm really thinking that we can do this for individuals. We can do it for, for um, people who have left um, whole jobs in, in communities. And we can do it in advance for communities that are going to be affected more as we move into new and different environmental policies and other policies. For instance, uh, one thing that I would love to do is to work in the, in the communities that are uh, closing coal-fired power plants. Sometimes they're closing the coal mine as well. Let's look at what the competencies of the whole community are, not just the individuals that are going to be immediately affected, but the whole community. The person who's working um, in the grocery store and in the local auto body. What interests, aptitudes, capacities do they already have? And then let's look at what kinds of competencies are going to be required by potential employers that may be interested in setting up shop if they only knew what, what the competencies in this community already are and what it would take to fill the gaps, to move them from where they are to where they need to be. You know, when, when Prime Minister Trudeau talks about the middle class and wanting to protect the middle class, he talks about, um, about this all the time and he's putting all kinds of programs in there, but as everybody knows, the best program, the best social program is a good job. So let's, let's use the, the capacity we have to adapt, change, and grow as leaders to help communities and individuals adapt, change, and grow into the new economy. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it off. Thanks, Janet. Um, and for those of you who at home, I'm, I uh, try to use this as a way to tell people to read good stuff. Read Rachel's paper. Uh, Janet has also done really great work on uh, on competencies. We've leaned heavily on it when we've talked about apprenticeships. We're pro apprenticeships around here, Janet. You could just say for it around here. Um, you don't need to worry about that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna send it to Sean, and we're gonna get into some questions. Um, but Sean, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to frame what I've heard. I'm gonna try to coalesce a little bit, which is the question of um, that sort of revolves around. Um, the role of markets vis-a-vis -vis government, the fact that, you know, there are things beyond government's control, which, you know, I would be the first to admit, and I think Rachel is right on point when she says that. But Janet, both Janet, Wayne, uh, and Rachel all said, we need to be thinking about the future, we need to be thinking about future markets and so on. I guess what I would love to hear, Sean, is you respond to that, and then Rachel, Janet, and Wayne, for you to be starting to think, um, as Sean responds, into the question, how do you know? How do you know? Because um, I, th I think these are really good questions about how do you know which market's going to emerge and which one we can point to and that our investments in those places may be right or not. Um, I don't think it's impossible, but I just think it'd be, I'd be interested to hear what would be the best policy framework for going into an uncertain future when it comes to things that the government can't control and so on. So Sean, maybe I'll pass it to you and then I'm sure that we'll get, um, we'll get everybody uh, uh, pumping and we can go from there. Um. I'll, I'll be brief, Brian, um, because, um, you know, I want to hear from the others and, and uh, hear from those who've, who've chosen to, to join us today. Um, your question, in a way, is how is uh, Donald Rumsfeld's question. You know, there are known unknowns, there are known unknowns, and then there are unknown unknowns. And part of what you're talking about is, you know, how can public policy account for um, the unknown unknowns? Um, one thing I think we know um, is that there will continue to be uh, high market returns on education. Um, you know, that, that, it seems to me that's something that we can um, probably reasonably count on. Um, but what strikes me, Brian, and, and this is something we, we, try to, um, we try to reflect in the paper, is that notwithstanding, um, you know, decades of, of um, meaningful and substantive effort to expand post-secondary access. Uh, and by post-secondary, I include universities, colleges, and um, trade certificate programs. Uh, you know, the striking thing to me is the persistent share of the population that, that has high school diploma or less. It's about one third of those uh, in working age, so those between age 25 and 64. And what might be interesting to the audience is that number doesn't really change a whole lot across 
age categories, even amongst the, uh, uh, those aged uh, 25 to 34, there's still roughly 30% of the population without a post-secondary credential. And in an economy that's bifurcating along um, skills and oftentimes credentials are a proxy for skill, um, how, are, how are we going to ensure that we're producing employment, uh, meaningful employment um, uh, for, for these people? And as Janet says, uh, we've been fortunate for the better part of the past quarter century or longer that the natural resource sector has in many ways hoovered these people up. Um, and um, you know, that has been good for them and their families and their communities, um, but it's caused us as a society and as policymakers to be complacent, um, to not think about a policy framework um, um, that's designed to support those uh, without post-secondary credentials. Um, who in other jurisdictions have been dislocated from uh, sectors that have traditionally had demand um, for these types of workers. And I mentioned earlier, manufacturing being a big part of that. And in elsewhere, particularly in the United States, across parts of uh, American uh, geography, particularly in the Rust Belt, uh, we, we've seen these um, um, people um, uh, lose attachment to the labor force. And with that comes all of the um, uh, social and community consequences, Brian, that you have so eloquently described here and, and elsewhere. And so I guess in a nutshell, for me, fundamentally, this comes down to, uh, you know, assuming that there'll continue to be market returns for those with credentials. I'm not all that worried about um, those with post-secondary qualification. I actually think they get way too much attention when we're talking about labor market issues. And part of that, of course, is a function of um, self-selection and confirmation bias. Most of us who are participating in these conversations, either uh, in, a, in, a, in a venue like this or around the cabinet table, um, bring with them, uh, bring with us a, a, a lens or an experience of someone with post-secondary credentials and oftentimes postgraduate credentials. Uh, I think, you know, when we talk about the responsiveness of our politics and the need for diversity, um, the cohort in our society least represented are those without post-secondary qualifications. And um, they happen to be the ones who I think are most vulnerable um, in the modern dynamic um, uh, economy. And so I guess in, in some, uh, well, maybe not in some, a penultimate point, if I may. Um, um, uh, two things. One, I think Janet's point about thinking with regards to how we support uh, mid-career workers who are dislocated because of a combination of technology or trade or maybe policy-induced dislocation is fundamental. Uh, and for those workers, we're going to have to have some continued combination of income support and a plurality of training models to try to figure out what works. Um, Secondly, we're going to have to think about if the demand for mid-skilled workers declines in the natural resource sector, if it cannot be counted upon due to a combination of policy and markets to be a source of employment, um, or at least a major source of employment for these type of workers, then I think it behooves us to think about how we're going to organize our economy through, uh, through a policy framework to make sure that there continues to be demand for these type of workers, because I think um, ultimately an economy that, is, um, that isn't serving the median worker is unsustainable. Um, um, and, and so, you know, I think that's going to involve a combination of wage subsidies. It's going to involve a, a, a commitment to um, public infrastructure spending um, because of course the construction sector has served as such an, uh, similarly like natural resources, such a source of demand for mid-skilled workers, and other means to ensure that uh, those coming out of high school who aren't choosing for whatever reason to pursue a post-secondary path, that, um, that we've designed a public policy framework around them, whereby they can reasonably expect um, um, a, a future of uh, employment and, and opportunity. So I guess uh, now in sum, um, I, I would say, you know, the, the, we, we started the conversation around uh, the climate and natural resources, and, and that's obviously a, a crucial question 
in the immediate and medium term uh, and thinking about how we balance, balance these competing priorities. But I think the long-term goal, the long-term orientation of our politics and policy needs to be around um, creating employment and opportunity, um, particularly those uh, for those without post-secondary credentials, because I, I, I think um, uh, if we fail to do that, um, the, the economic, social, and political consequences um, um, will will undoubtedly be significant. So I'm going to I'm actually going to pass it over to Rachel because I think Rachel wanted to get in. Um, but before before I do, I want to just queue up Wayne and Janet because I think a point here comes that that sort of overlapped with both of what you said, and that's particularly with regard to training people and the sort of models that we've we've adopted thus far, which has been I think heavily school based, heavily um, let's call it the sort of BA uh, BA bias or the BSc bias, the bachelor bias that I think our education systems have. Wayne and Janet, I'd love to hear you as to whether or not part of the problem is also the way in which we think about who's a worthy partner in, in terms of education and, and training. I think that other jurisdictions, if you look at the Ghent system in, in Europe or what have you, actually see union, in Canada, we see unions as primarily employer-employee relationships that, that deal with that inherently conflictual relationship. Whereas in other places, they see them as part of a broader industry, as part of their labor force policy and unions are leaned on heavily um, to, to do the work that, you know, currently um, we, we put quite a bit onto our, our bachelor's granting institutions, which again are great things, but I'm just wondering if you guys, Janet and Wayne can give some thought to that as Rachel responds to, to Sean's response. So Rachel, now the floor, the floor is yours. Well, I think Brian, you'd asked about how we know where the jobs are going to be and where the future is going. And, and that is really challenging. And that's one of the reasons why people talk about it as placing bets, because in a way they are bets and there is some uncertainty. And, and a lot of it depends on Canadian companies, um, how innovative they are, how competitive they can be, whether there is um, some sort of advantage in terms of the technology or the cost or even our proximity to the US could be a big advantage. So, you know, where we have a, a chance to be competitive really depends on those things. Um, but there's some exciting things happening in Canada right now in terms of the companies that are coming up and developing these new technologies. And so I'm pretty optimistic that um, at least some of those will work out. And, you know, in terms of where that economic activity takes place, that's a different policy question than will there be economic activity in response to this? And, and so if we're trying to think about where does it take place, then you need to think more locally. You need to look at, okay, well, in this region, what is their advantage? What is, what is their, what's the resource they have available? What are the competencies of the, of the people who work there? And where do they have a real chance of succeeding? Because it's not going to help anyone if, if, you know, governments could pour money into a, a new facility or something like that. But if there's no market for it at the end of the day, um, that's not gonna help. So the other thing that can be done is um, Canadian climate policies actually drive demand for a lot of these products. Um, so if, if you're, for example, trying to uh, develop geothermal because you think the geothermal has a particular potential in, in regions that need jobs, um, maybe there can be some, some policy that, that is more favorable towards uh, geothermal development. So you can start to think about what we call both the technology development side and the technology adoption side and connect those two things. So that as the climate policies are pulling things to market, you also are pushing uh, in the right places to get those things where they need to be. Does that square, just, just as a follow-up, how does that square with your earlier comment about governments have little control over markets? Like, I think there's a, um, like, and I, again, I'm, I, I actually acknowledge in the beginning, and I think it's an important one, that there is some, that there is some role that the government plays, and I think you're alluding to it when you're talking about polling and so on. Maybe you can just describe a little bit about, about the nature of that. So I would say governments have little control over global markets, but we have quite a bit of control over domestic markets, and particularly when we're talking about low carbon technologies, because the markets for those are driven by government policy. You know, how, how much um, technology you need really is, well, how stringent is the policy I have to meet? You know, what you're willing to spend on those things depends on the policy. So starting to connect where we go on policy 
with where we want um, the economic opportunities to happen is really important. And, and I'll, I'll use the example of buses, for example, um, on, a, on electric buses or hydrogen buses. There's a lot of potential, Canada. There's some companies that are developing great technologies that have a lot of export potential. So if we grow the demand domestically in Canada, help grow those markets, help those, those companies um, to, to increase in scale and be able to compete on the world stage, that's a huge advantage. And we can do that in other sectors too. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Wayne, Janet, um, and by the way, Rachel's with the one takeaway of talking about uh, paying attention to regional differences, the thing that kept coming to my mind was the, I think it was in the seventies that one, um, probably goes down in the sort of annals of terrible policies, the idea of putting a cucumber greenhouse in Newfoundland. Um, <laughs> that's, I think what you're alluding to is let's not do that. <laughs> let's pay attention to what's actually going on in places like Fort McMurray or, or uh, yeah, off of Hibernia there. Wayne, uh, Janet, perhaps you guys can respond to the question that I queued you up on earlier. Wayne, you go first. Sure, thanks, Janet. I, sounds like I wanna hear more about that greenhouse uh, project in Newfoundland, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, a lot to say about this, and I, I might come across sounding a bit more optimistic than the, the narrative that we have this urgent need to, to reskill this army of workers in the short to midterm. That, it is a very important discussion, and I, I recall those conversations with Janet in Fort McMurray years ago about essential skills development and competency. That that is important and there's a lot of work to do equipping our existing workforce with uh, enhanced skills, full stop. But this notion that we are going to have an army of current workers in the resource sector who need to be redeployed elsewhere in the short term is not, certainly not our experience. In fact, uh, while we may never get to the type of boom that we saw in Fort McMurray 10 years ago, uh, and I might agree that that's probably a good thing, actually. Uh, it is not accurate that we won't see rises in other forms of activity in the resource sector that drives very significant employment. Uh, right now, for example, in Alberta, there's a petrochemical boom, lots of capital investment in petrochemical. That's going to continue for a while. And so you see the workforce shift from, from one area to another, and, and then there's the LNG, and then we there's been other talk about a massive infrastructure deficit across the country that needs the same skill set. And so on a macro level, we're actually anticipating not needing to reskill hundreds of thousands of workers, but that we're actually short hundreds of thousands of workers for the work in the skilled sector that we have in front of us. And so the discussion today is a good one because natural resources plays a huge part of it, but it is not the only thing driving uh, what looks to be a pretty robust decade in front of us. Build Force Canada, which maybe most of us are familiar with, I serve on the board there, so I, I really like their work. They project a shortage in the next 10 years of close to 100,000 workers in that middle class skill base workforce. And so that, that presents other challenges that we have as an industry and as unions and governments and everyone else to make sure that whichever specific sector they're engaged in, those workers are there uh, because overall the economy will rely on them. Janet, over to you. Thanks, Wayne. I, boy, so much to say about this. The, um, First thing we have to do is make sure that people are ready, willing, and able to learn. And this is where those essential skills come in. And sometimes people who've been in a, in a job, in one particular job for a long time, they may have had to learn um, a little bit through, the, through, the, through their work as processes and materials changed, but generally they may not see themselves as learners. So um, the first thing I always want to do is point out to, you know, to people, if you haven't been reading, if you haven't been practicing your, your numeracy skills, brush up on them because that's the first place that you need to, to, uh, to brush up if you're going to have to learn something new. Um, and I hear what, what Wayne is, has said. It's absolutely true that we are, um, that we are going to be short of people 
in the construction trades and, and other, you know, other skilled trades. Partly that's because we've done a very poor job, my generation and, and the next, in encouraging our young people to, to think of the, the trades as a really good place to be. Um, partly because when I was young, uh, it was the push to university meant that, um, and I, and I did go to university, but my first degree is in biology. I never practiced in biology a day in, in my life, um, be, but it did, that learning did open doors for me. And we have, we have persuaded young people that the best way to open all the doors is to go to university to the detriment of some young people who actually are, would be much better off not going to university and um, doing something that is more college-based or, or um, a combination, you know, that learning for the trades is a combination of on the job and college-based uh, work. And so uh, we, have to, we have to start shifting um, and, and, you know, we call it the parity of esteem between um, a trades, a, a skilled trade and, and an undergraduate degree both um, are very valuable to, to, the, to the holders um, throughout their lifetime. Learning happens everywhere if you're looking for it. And as we move into new technologies and needing to upgrade our digital skills, I mean, if, if anything, this year of COVID has shown us is how much digital skills need to be upgraded. There are lots of places that people can learn how to do that. And most jobs are going to be affected by technology, even, you know, some of the more, uh, well, definitely the, not even even, but you know, a lot of the construction trades are changing. The tech, the tools and, and techniques are changing all the time and they're becoming more and more digital. People will need to upgrade those skills. And there are, you know, massive online learning uh, courses that are available. I wanted to actually go, you know, I put in a plug for, for unions too in this. And that is that, um, the unions that have caught on to this, and, and uh, CLIC was always one that trained its workers better than some, um, but the unions that have caught on to training as being their biggest value add to their members are the ones that are succeeding and will continue to succeed into the future. Um, we wrote a paper a couple of years ago about um, the the 21st century challenge for unions being to make sure that their members are competent. And if, if that happens, if, if unions do that work and do it well, then they won't lack for members and they won't lack for jobs because they will be the human resources partner with employers to make sure that everything ends up being on time and on budget, which is what employers care about when they're building, right? So it, it's, um, it's a vicious, not a vicious, it's a virtuous cycle that if unions help to make sure that their, their people are fully competent when they go to the job every day, that they are ready, willing, and able to do the task of the job that day, that's when, when unions will, will succeed more. And it's, it is all about training and, and being just slightly ahead of the curve, knowing what's coming, what changes in processes and um, materials are happening. And that can be in regular construction. It can be in, in, in the new jobs that are coming through the, through the green economy. Um, if, you, if you get ahead of that, then unions will, will become much more important uh, to the employers um, in the future. I want to ask. We, we're almost out of time, and this has been a really great discussion so far. And I think we're, we'll end. Uh, we'll end with this question. I'd love to hear everyone's response. I think we've talked a lot about the sort of challenging and complexities of it. That that it's really a multi-pronged uh, policy uh, effort. Everything ranging from labor policy to education policy to pricing, uh, pricing carbon, to, and you name it. It's it's quite a complex issue. And I think that's part of the challenge when one is trying to do this politically. So let's not forget that this is a, Sean alluded to the, um, the political and social ramifications of not addressing this properly, um, of not sort of actually paying attention and saying to people, we see you, we see that there's a need and we, we're actually working to address it. So I wonder if, if, um, if we can sort of ask this as the next, last question, if you're you know, let's pretend we have some influence here and that some uh, politician writing speeches or making policy is going to be listening to us. Uh, we don't have to pretend there are people on this call who are, who are asking these types of questions. 
How do you speak about this issue? It's so complex. Uh, a lot of what you said here is not gonna come across very well when you're trying to say, this is the policy we're doing. What type of rhetoric, um, when you're talking about the, the resource sector, what type of rhetoric does one embrace? I mean, what, what um, you know, Rachel, uh, who's talking, it doesn't sound to me to be anti-resource development at all. Um, in fact, nobody on this call did. How does, one, how does one go about that? And perhaps we'll sort of leave that as the sort of rhetorical flourish. Um, this is the sort of classic classical education. We've done the grammar, the logic, and let's finish with the rhetoric. Um, why don't we start, we'll start, uh, one of you uh, folks can jump in and then we'll give Sean the last word and, and, and um, we'll go from there. Maybe Rachel, we can start with you. Yeah, I'm not sure I have the perfect solution, um, but one of the things that we realized is, I mean, when we wrote our clean growth paper that we released in September, we set out, to, you know, what does success look like? What does a successful transition look like? And what would make it not successful? And that's how we chose those 11 indicators that we selected, um, which, which looked at things like um, economic growth, technology development, infrastructure investment, um, jobs, uh, affordability, you know, those are the things that matter. And if you fall down on any one of those things, people are going to be concerned. So instead of thinking of it um, as a challenge of reducing emissions for the lowest cost per ton or something like that, we, we need to have a broader perspective that really thinks about, well, what is what does transition look like? And what does it um, mean for the people who are going to be affected by that? Um, in, in across all of those dimensions. And I think if that, you know, and we've seen this example in other countries as well, where if you get one thing wrong, if you, if you, even if it's a very minor change in policy, it can have a huge blowback um, just, just because it's, it's on top of some underlying issue that's already there that's been festering for a while. So um, it, Canadian governments hopefully can be very aware of what the situation is, what the challenges are people are facing, and to try and make their lives better as opposed to harder. Thanks, Rachel. Sean, did you want to, I see you furiously taking notes over there. Do you want to, uh, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, well, let me just thank uh, you again, Brian and Cardis, for the opportunity to, to contribute um, both the paper and to today's discussion and for the other panelists for their perspectives. Um, you know, it's been very, enlightening and, and um, you know, the discussion has caused me to, to think a lot. Um, on your kind of, you're asking about sort of a, a, you know, what's the political economy framework for thinking about these issues, particularly uh, with respect to the tension between a, a more ambitious climate agenda and the potential negative impacts on employment in the natural resource sector. You know, I think there, I'd have kind of two conceptual points I'd make. The first is something I think that, that, that both Rachel and, and Wayne said earlier, um, it's to position and characterize the natural resource sector as a major part of Canada's economic future. Um, you know, this cannot be characterized as managing decline. It has to be, has to be characterized and conceived of as managing a, a, a transformation that is going to ensure that this sector remains a major, not just a major source of, of economic activity, but employment and um, community-based opportunity, um, you know, this seems like a subtle and, um, point or maybe just a matter of mere rhetoric, but I think it's fundamental, particularly at a time when we're observing kind of growing regional um, fissures between Ottawa and our energy producing um, provinces. I just think it's fundamental that uh, particularly this government um, is clear uh, about the future of the natural resource sector is fundamental to Canada's economy. The second, is that the Trudeau government has done two things that I think um, have uh, applicability to these questions. The first is um, the effort in the climate action rebate to try to offset or account for the income or household distributional effects of the carbon tax. I think there's an opportunity to extend that type of thinking um, to the distribution of employment effects from climate action. How can we kind of take the principle of thinking of both the costs and the benefits and, organ and incorporating them into the policy process. I think there's an opportunity to extend that further. Um, the second related is that um, participants and, 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 and viewers will be familiar with the growing adoption of gender-based analysis at the federal level. Um, the most recent fall economic statement in particular, I think, 
represented a, a major policy innovation, the extent to which gender-based analysis was incorporated um, uh, as it related to you know, different policy choices throughout the document. I, I think we need to push that analysis further. Um, to date, it's been principally about trying to account for the tendency of public policy to neglect the, the economic and social uh, role of women in our economy and society. And in, and in that sense, gender-based analysis has been a useful correction um, to the tendency to um, uh, uh, fail to account for the implications of policy on women in our society. But I think we need to extend the gender-based analysis further um, as we go forward so that um, um, as we're thinking about not just climate policy changes, but public policy more generally, we're trying to account as at a granular level as possible for the implications for different people in different places. I think that's the way to root these discussions um, um, in the, the people and places that will be affected by our choices. And, and, and in that sense, Brian, serve as a sort of insurance policy against the, um, against the rise of disruptive politics that we've seen elsewhere. There, there's a, a British scholar who's described Brexit as revenge of places that, don't, that didn't matter. And I think that we need to make sure that we are not creating the kind of conditions in this country for people and places to feel like they don't matter. Um, that won't just be crucial to, to, to the development of a climate policy agenda going forward, but public policy more generally. Thanks, Sean. That's a, that's a great spot to end. And I think that um, your point about extending uh, that analysis into the further, the further parts of what makes people Canadians, the different ways in which they live their lives, is something that was the point of this project. The point of this project, um, work is about more than money, was attempting to get government to say that, look, when a job disappears, it's not just an income that disappears, but it has an impact on that person's family, on their local hockey team, or whatever team it is that they're volunteering. Um, it has broader community implications for them to take that, that really local uh, incarnate nature of, of the way that our economy works uh, more seriously. Um, and I think we've had that discussion today. And I, I really want to thank you, Sean, uh, for your time and for, for your work on this paper uh, with us. Uh, Rachel, I'm very grateful again for your work and I would commend it to everybody um, and for your insights into this contribution, our, our insights into this conversation. They've been a major contribution. I'm really really glad for it and I'm glad you could join us and I look forward to meeting you in person one of the days we can have a cup of tea or something else and uh, uh, Wayne uh, again uh, grateful it's it's always good I, I think it's been one of the challenges in our um, conversation to not hear from people who are actually working with folks on the ground and so the fact that you're able to be here uh, and contribute to the discussion I think is important and I look forward to more of that and Janet uh, again your insights into that sort of the granularity of um, what needs to be done to address uh, and equip people so that they continue can continue to work and have the competencies to do that work that brings them meaning and identity is very important. So, uh, you know, normally in a full room, we'd all be clapping for you now. I'm sure people are at their desks uh, um, as they're sipping their cup of coffee. But I just want to thank you all very much. I want to thank all of you uh, who uh, attended and, and tuned in and asked questions uh, across the country. We didn't get to them all. We will uh, hopefully uh, continue this conversation. Uh, again. And so thank you very much. Thank you, panel, uh, and look forward to seeing everybody again sometime soon in person.